the Joe Rogan experience. What was your first gig? Like, what was the first <laughs> first professional gig that you got where it was like, holy shit, I'm getting paid to do makeup? Well, I mean, the first time I ever got paid, actually, to do anything, I did a, a makeup for a stage actor who wanted to be old. And uh, I charged him $75. And... Um, which was, you know, more money than I ever gotten from anything before. <laughs> like I said, you just came up with a number in your head. Yeah, well, I kind of somehow figured it out, <laughs> you know. But, uh, anyways, I, I I did these pieces for him, and uh, he lived uh, off that Pasadena freeway, that one that has the weird right angled uh, uh, off ramps, you know. And my dad drove me there because I couldn't, and I didn't drive at the time. And and he actually had a makeup kit and had a, some hair pieces in it and a bunch of stuff. And he said, you know, I will trade you this. Instead of giving you the $75, I'll give you this makeup case and with full of this stuff. And I was like, yeah, that's really cool. You know, but my dad wanted to teach me, you know, responsibilities and stuff. And this was around the time I, I, I think I was like 16 and was going to try to drive. And he goes, uh, your, my insurance is going to go up. And what you have to do is you have to get that money and you have to give me the money to, for the rate of the insurance that's going up. It's like, oh, man, I really want this makeup kit. <laughs> you know? but, but, I mean, I had amazing parents who, I mean, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for them. I mean, they, That's su- cool. they supported me uh, in my crazy decision to, to make monsters for a living. Well, they must have been so happy when it paid off, though. Yeah, I was glad that they lived long enough to see that. And I got to bring my parents to the Oscars a few times. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, they were, they were very proud and... and uh, and, you know, it was funny because, I mean, I had, like, my mom's uh, brother and my uncle would, you know, say stuff like, you know, when is Ricky going to stop doing this silly stuff and do something he can make a living at, you know? And when is oh, he going to grow people. up? And, yeah. Oh, those people. But, you know, my dad oh. basically never grew up, and I knew I never was going to, you know. I mean, what was your dad? What did he do for a living? Well, he did a bunch of different things. He he was a high school dropout because he he had to help his family, his, his mother and father, you know, pay bills. And he had a variety of not very good jobs. He worked at Sears as a salesman. He drove a truck. He did stuff. But he was always, he, he was very creative and it was kind of held down in his lifetime. You know, don't do that. You can't, right. you know, do something you can make Need a living be at. And because of that, I benefited from that. He yeah. supported the creativity. And when I, um, I think I was a sophomore in high school, he decided he wanted to try to make a living as an artist. And we lived on my mom's bank teller salary for a number of years, he hardly made any money at all. Um, but he was happy, you know, and, and he, uh, because, I mean, like I said, he, he supported my creativity and he was really my first teacher. He, he sh- showed me what you could do with paint. He knew a little bit about sculpture, you know, uh, he, uh, he was also a fan of monster movies, you know, and he, mm. you know, he saw, you know, the Freddie March, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde when it came out, you know, and, told me all about it. And that was a movie that they didn't have on TV that I really wanted to see, you mm. know. And he said, uh, when he saw it in, in the theaters, you know, he would had, had to hide his eyes or hide behind the seat, you know. <laughs> and I so wanted to see that. And and he also said, you know, War of the Worlds, the uh, George Powell. Uh, oh, the, yeah. You know, go, oh, that was so cool. And the sound effects were great. And, and our, that was never on either. And when I was in the seventh grade, I think it was, I... Uh, decided to get on the student council for the main reason this was my plan was uh, I suggested that we could raise money for the school by having showing movies after school we could rent 16 millimeter movie 16 millimeter movies and show them and charge admission and I basically just went through all the movies I hadn't seen that I wanted to see and, and got those you know and, and there were maybe four or five people that showed up to see him but I was happy you know? oh, that's so, awesome yeah what was the first film that you did special effects for first film was a film called the Octo man and it's kind of a cult classic because it's such a crappy movie, you know. It was shot in 10 days uh, at, at all at Bronson Canyon uh, in, in, in Griffith Park. What uh, year was this? Uh, nine, let's see. I graduated from high school in 1969, and I went to two years to a junior college, uh, 69, 70, 71, uh, I guess it was. So um, you went from that to Star Wars only like five or six years later, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, and King Kong and, and all oh, those stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah. Played, there's the Octo Man. The Octo Man. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't design oh, it. Oh my and goodness! I, Look at I, that thing. Yeah, but I mean, this was I was a full time student. I had six weeks, <laughs> and like a, I think a thousand dollars to make this suit. And uh, so I after school 
uh, I, and I got my a friend, the very first job I ever had, actually, this and this again happened because of my dad, when he was a truck driver uh, delivering plumbing supplies, uh, he went to the wrong building, and the building he went into was uh, called Cloakie Productions, and they made Gumby and Davy and Goliath, stop motion animation, mm. which I did stop motion as well, big Ray Harryhausen fan, you know. Um, and for some reason, I grew up in Covina, which is east of you know L.A., like 30 or 40 miles. And, wasn't, and there wasn't anything film-related out there. But for some reason, Cloakies was out there, um, I think because it was cheaper rent. And he I, – I was my, – on my quarter-a-week allowance, when I found a place I could buy rubber, it was like eight – almost $9 for a quarter rubber. And, you know, it took me a lot of weeks and a lot of mowing lawns and a lot of stuff to save up that money. And I said, I need a, I need a job. So I, I didn't have a car. We only had one car in the family. And, I, you know, I went to any place I could walk to, uh, supermarkets, you know, bus boys, all this stuff. Nobody wanted me. And um, my dad said, oh, I remember this place. And it did stop motion. And you'd stop motion, you know, maybe. So I went there with my box of stuff, you know, and, and it was summer vacation between my junior and senior year of high school. And they said, start tomorrow. Uh, got paid minimum wage, which I think was, you know, $1.25 or something at the time. But that place was like a magnet for any weird kid or any kind of, it was like a stop motion fan. Any stop motion person would show up there at one point or another. And I met this guy named Doug Beswick, who was a few years older than me. And we became, again, fast friends. You know, he read Famous Monsters. He was a Ray Harryhausen fan. And Doug, uh, when I did this this uh, Octoman film, Doug had a, a a little workshop, and we did it in his workshop, and we did it together. But, wow. But, yeah, it was a, a, and, and it was a real introduction to the film industry because it was the very first day's filming, a filming in, in Bronson Canyon, Griffith Park. Uh, we show up. We went in Doug's 57 Chevy. that had Octoman in the back seat, you know, and, <laughs> and we show up there and... and looking around and there's nobody there and I go what the hell you know so and this is you know before cell phones and all that shit uh so we'd have to go we went back down the hill uh, down Bronson Canyon to like there was a market there and we got a pay phone called the production office and it was like oh yeah we, uh, we pushed one day we just forgot to tell you you know and it's like a movie called the Octoman you forgot to tell the people who were making the Octoman, the title character of the movie, that you weren't filming, you know? And, and it was also, I mean, they... That's I, a perfect introduction to the movie industry, though. Oh, it was. And and I learned that, that you know, that you can't believe anything they tell you, you know? I mean, <laughs> the, it was designed by somebody else. And uh, I got this job handed down through people I met at Cloakies. Uh, it was going to be stop motion at one point. They decided that was too expensive. They're going to make a suit. And the first thing I did was a little maquette. And, uh, um, a little what? Maquette, a, a small sculpture of the design. But I said there's – because he had they, – they tried to figure out how they could do eight tentacles on a man. you know, mm. And his feet kind of like turned into tentacles and it kind of split off in, into a back tentacle. But I said I think they look like elf shoes. And, uh. and it's not a good for, way for me to join the two things together. And, and it's like, kid, don't worry about it. There's only going to be one shot of the Octoman in the movie where you actually see it. The rest of the time is just going to be a shadow or a glimpse, you know. But we'll have a money shot where you can, you know, make sure it looks great. <laughs> the movie starts out with a close-up of his feet, you know, basically, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and you know, it was it, it was a real introduction. I, I thought it was going to be like working on eight millimeter, millimeter movies like I did as a kid. You know, everybody right. just jumps in and we're, we're making a movie. Let's do it. You know? Right. Yeah, it wasn't that. And the DP, the director of photography, because I had long hair. And Doug had long hair. He called us the girls. This was at a time when you know, oh, long hair great. was, you know, oh, get the girls to get their silly monster suit out, and you know. And, oh, and, great. Uh, but we, there was a, if you can believe this, there's, it, it, the Octoman was written by the guy that was the writer of Creature from the Black Lagoon. And he also wrote, uh, It Came from Outer Space. Ah. So it was basically those two scripts combined with, evolu- uh, with uh, ecology thrown in. Uh, and he, we, you know, it was like, there's this day where the, instead of in, you know, in the creature, they, they put a log across the, the lagoon and they can't get out. You know, here it was a log across the street and they're driving in Win- Winnebago and they can't get out. You know, and they get out to try to get the log out and they, they open the Winnebago door and the Octoman's in there and, uh, he knocks a guy down and then they, they're supposed to, the other guy's supposed to pick up a log and throw it at the Octoman. And I go, you know, where's the prop log that we're going to use? And, and, uh, and, you know, 
he goes, well, it's that. It's that. And I go, that's, that's a tree limb. You know, I go, that, that's going to hurt the guy in the suit and it's going to hurt the suit. You know, and I go, and we, we, we're going to rehearse this, right? And he goes, no, we don't have time to rehearse it. And I go, well, oh. when he, the octoman is supposed to bend over and pick up the Pier Angeli, who was the female lead who killed herself after this movie. I can tell you how good the movie was, you know. But, um, I said, when he goes to pick her up, let's cut there because if you cut, I can wrap the tentacles around her and it'll look more like he's holding her, you know. So anyways, they start filming without rehearsing. Octoman opens the door and knocks a guy down. The guy picks up a log, throws it at the Octoman, hits him, rips the suit. He goes walking over and he's virtually blind. He's looking out of two little holes out this far away. You know, it was a real claustrophobic suit. The poor guy, Reed Morgan, who played the Octoman, was great to deal with, but it was a very hard suit to wear. He goes to pick up here, Angeli. Nobody says cut, so he picks her up. So walking around, the guy who he knocked on the ground is laying on the ground, spread eagle. He ends up stepping right on his nuts. Oh! Falls over backwards, throws Pierangeli up oh. against, uh, against the Winnebago. Oh! She's crying, says he wants her mother. The other guy's holding her nuts. You know, oh, the guy Jesus. broke his hand because the log fell on his hand. And everybody's screaming, I'm going, you ripped my suit! <laughs> you oh, know? And, God. And we lost a day out of our 10 day shooting schedule. So Harry Essex, who was the director and writer, was tearing pages out of the script like this. In Bryce, just, we don't need this, we don't need this, we don't need this. And then when they tried to make a movie out of it, it made no sense. So, I mean, I think the, f- the first 20 minutes are stock footage. If, you know, in the beginning, there was nothing. And then, you know, then there was slime. And then, you know, the whole... I can't wait to watch it. Oh, no, it's... it's uh, it, there's a... Uh, I think it's in public domain now. I think it's on YouTube, but there's oh, a, a, a Blu-ray out of it as yeah. well. I, think. I might have to fire up a joint and watch that one. <laughs> now, when you, when, when you look back on that, I mean, it's got to be kind of, I mean, even though it sounds like a clusterfuck, it seems like it's kind of a fond memory as well, because that was where it started. It I was, mean, yeah. you, you got to see uh, how much nonsense there is in the movie industry, but you also got a chance to get going. Yeah, and and I got, you know, we, we came up with a way to do this because we couldn't, it's a foam rubber suit, and foam rubber has to be baked in an oven. We didn't have a big oven. We didn't have the means, so we, we came up with a clever solution, and- it's what I had to do so many times in films, do things that people hadn't done before on a budget and a schedule, you know, and, and try to figure out. And that's part of the fun, you know. Yeah. But, but what was cool about the Octoman, the, the, the male lead was uh, Kerwin Matthews, who was Sinbad in The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, oh. which, I, again, a Ray Harryhausen film and I was a yeah. big, big fan of, you know. So uh, one of the first things I had to do, there's a scene where the Octoman's tentacle is supposed to creep through this cave opening and they basically – wadded up some tar paper and I stood behind the tar paper in Bronson Caves and stuck my hand in this tentacle and did, it, did this. And when Kerwin walked by, uh, I said, super dynamation, which is what Ray Harryhausen's technique he called for a few films. And he goes, oh, you know about that. You know, so I thought that was really cool. 